I don't know when I'm corresponding author for something. Usually it's just who has the most stable address. I've never paid attention to that at all. So again, it's a multidimensional question. I think the usual, if, if it's going to be student and advisor, it's usually the student is the first author and the advisor is the last author. That's the usual. Again, I'm a little bit more, you know, I want to see the advisor contribute more than just, you know, being the advisor. Uh, but that's, that's my feeling. It should be people who made significant contributions to the overall effort and I, maybe a slight caveat is if you're being paid specifically to do a particular task, then that may reduce the uh, impetus for you to be included as an author. Okay? Okay. So you send off your paper. And the best thing you can do for quite a while is forget about it. Right? You send off your paper, and with luck, it won't be returned to you in a week without review. With luck, it will be sent out for review, and two or three um, reviewers around the world will look at your paper and notice positives and negatives about it. Usually they give kind of an overall score, but you're usually provided with comments more in, in the form of text. <coughs> so the question is what to do. So imagine I give you a handful of coins, right? And every time, for every comment from a reviewer where you are able to say, yes, change is made. You don't have to spend any money. Okay? Every time you do not object and you just respond how the reviewer wanted you to, you still have that handful of coins. But every time you do something like, I absolutely disagree with, and because of that reason, I think that the reviewer is uninformed and ignorant, <coughs> guess what? You just spent about all of your coins. Every time you do something like, I would respectfully disagree with the, the reviewer's suggestion. My reason is this, this, and this. Well, maybe you've lost half of your coins. And every time you say, the reviewer makes a good point, but I, instead of adding the citation that the reviewer suggests, Instead, I'm adding a citation of this other paper, which I feel is more appropriate. Then maybe you're only spending one penny. <coughs> but this is a really important concept. Because, you know, we all feel that our work was perfect when we submitted it. And we all feel that the reviewers are idiots. Unless they like it. Right? And so when you design that response to the editor, where you are changing your manuscript or not in, in response to the reviews, you have to remember this concept. So the first thing to do is understand what the editor sends to you. Thank you very much for submitting your manuscript. This is this. The reviewers and I appreciate the work you have accomplished. Based on the reviews, we will not be able to accept this manuscript for publication. Oh, that's too bad. It's been rejected. Now let's read farther. At this time, we would be willing to consider a much revised version based on the review comments. So that's actually pretty good. What the editor is saying, translated, is the reviewers gave you these comments. You respond positively to as many of them as possible, and we're going to accept your paper. But if you only do like the minimum possible, 
or if you debate and contest too many of them, we're going we're to reject your paper. Okay? Now, there's, there's more information in here. Conceptual papers as this one are difficult to write. That was difficult to write. Here, both reviewers stress that the arguments and balanced view of the debate should be better presented and not as vague. So there's what the editor really cares about. Okay? So if you're going to disagree with something, don't disagree with that. Make deep, substantive revisions in that direction. And then the last thing is both reviewers were very generous in their constructive comments and a revised version, stress revised, could make a great contribution. That's a way of saying the editor believes the opinions and trusts both reviewers. Sometimes an editor will say, reviewer number two was especially insightful in picking out this and this and this and this. That's the editor's way of saying, ignore reviewer one. Okay? So you really have to read between the lines to understand these letters. Because what the editor doesn't want to do is have to do 10 different revisions, because that's a lot of work for the editor, or um, have you feel that he or she committed to publishing your paper, and then you do a crummy revision, and there's a disagreement about whether your paper should be published. So here we go. In general, just say OK. When you can't quite say OK, then be reasonable and change something. And when you really disagree, then state a clear reasoning as to why. So here's the secret. Remember we talked about this being a game. This is the secret. If you're talking about a major journal or even a minor journal, Finding reviewers for papers is hard. For the journals where I'm an associate editor or editor, sometimes I have to ask five people before one will say yes. Okay? It's really hard. And so if you get frustrated about why your paper takes so long to be reviewed, it's oftentimes because it's hard to find people to review it. So the worst thing that can happen to the editor is for there ha to have to be a second round of reviews. It's double the work for the editor to do another round of reviews. So what you really want to have happen is you want to convince the editor that you made a deep, considered, serious revision and so the editor doesn't need to send it out for another round of review. Okay? If you can do that, then your paper gets accepted. Doesn't always happen. You know, like that letter that I, set, I showed you a moment ago from the editor where it was, you know, profound revision, that's probably going to get sent back out and it was. The paper is published now. Um, but sometimes you get, you know, a, a middle-of-the-road revision where the editor is saying, the reviewers raised some important points and I will not accept your paper until you address them. Sometimes, and this is the perfect situation, you go back to the editor with a good revision. The editor reads it and says, you know, looks like they responded just the way the reviewer wanted. I'll accept it. And that is when you struck gold. That's the best thing that can happen. So how do you do it? I like separating the comment from the reviewer and my response very clearly and very visually. Okay? Don't make the editor work to find the information that he or she needs to be able to accept your paper without further review. So, very best responses are these. So then here, I find that the paper is too long. 
The manuscript has been, this is my answer, the manuscript has been shortened quite a bit with two major sections removed entirely or shortened massively. It may not be obvious to the editor that I removed those sections. So I want to make sure that he or she can see it. Now, when you disagree, this was that same letter that we got that I showed you a moment ago. The reviewer comes in with a clearly British, by the way. Uh, where's the fence? There at the top. Uh, realized. Um, you can always try to figure out who your reviewers are. It's, you're never right. But there's this kind of polemic. And we came back and said, the reviewer is basically criticizing us on the basis that we have neglected what we consider to be the main point of the paper. So we were pretty angry. <laughs> you know, but you can't say, the stupid reviewer is, right? You have to give the reasoning. And so, again, we were pretty upset. But that doesn't allow you to get angry. This probably cost us half of the coins that we had in our hand at the beginning. But it was a pretty dumb comment from the reviewer. Um, and then sometimes you get to this level. So the editor-in-chief makes this comment. And then here's our response. Sometimes, in the worst of cases, you're even putting in figures and analyses just to prove a point to the editor and reviewers. That should be very rare, but sometimes it does happen. So, you send that back to the editor, and again, hopefully, if, you, if you've played the game right, it gets accepted without a second round of review. Sometimes you get the second round of review, you make the revision. My feeling is that the maximum number of reviews that any paper should see is two. I say that a third or subsequent round of review is irresponsibility by the editor. Um, we had a situation recently with a now former student in the niche modeling group who submitted a paper to a prestigious journal. The editor had it reviewed, turned it back to her, had it reviewed again, turned it back to her, had it reviewed again, she revised it. And I, so that's three, re three rounds of review, nine reviewers. And then I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. This editor is needing either to make a decision or to reject the paper. And so she wrote the editor and she said, I'm making yet another major revision. Do you plan to send this back out for review? And the answer was yes. And so I got very angry. And what I did was to write the editor in chief. And I said, look, 12 independent reviews for a single paper is ridiculous. This is a student who's searching for postdocs right now, and she needs to build her CV with quality work that she's done. This is a quality paper. 12 reviews is an unreasonable punishment. I don't know what the associate editor's problem is, but I will thank you if you will put a stop to this. Either reject the paper or make an editorial decision when this next revision comes in. And indeed, the head editor chose to accept the paper. But that sort of, you know, going head to head with the head editor, don't do it, okay? It's not very fun. Okay, so let's imagine that your paper gets accepted. You'll get some minor instructions from the journal about, okay, now we need the final copies of the uh, figures, those TIFF images that we produced earlier, whatever. Um, so now the publication mechanism is moving along, right? So really the next time you see your paper is in proof, okay? And the idea of proofs is that this is the last time you're able to check 
the manuscript that it has the proper content before publication. Okay? Whatever problems and errors are not detected at the proof stage are your fault and your problem. So you have to check the entire proof in minute detail. You have to put special attention to the things that are hardest to read. Equations, tables, literature cited. When I was in graduate school, the custom was that you would read it backwards, out loud to another person. And so you could, anybody who was fortunate enough to have a paper accepted and get the proofs, could say to any other graduate student, um, Rodrigue, I need help with this. Can you give me your afternoon? And generally, Rodrigue would say yes. And we would literally read the paper word by word, backwards, one of us reading to the other, to catch the errors. One person with the final manuscript, one person with the proof. That was more necessary 20, 30 years ago when the manuscript was going to be retyped by the publisher, typeset. Now what they do is they take your electronic version and they strip it of all the formatting and they put it into their template, but they really don't retype it. So now it's a little bit less sensitive. But this is your last opportunity. Remember the editing marks. And they're more important now because they're not to communicate to you or to your student. Now they are communicating to the, the typesetter at the publisher.